All right, you're going to need a Bible today. You're going to need a Bible. First Chronicles chapter 29. If you've got a Bible on your smartphone, on your tablet, you can use that. If you need one of our Bibles, uh, we have ushers coming up and down the aisles. They will pass a Bible out to you. You're going to find First Chronicles 29 on page 357. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, consider this our gift to you. We would love to, love to be able to bless you with this, uh, with this Bible here. My name's Chad Blackman. I'm the pastor of student ministry here at Shelter Cove. What that means is most Sundays, I'm upstairs uh, teaching and leading for the high school ministry, uh, but every once in a while I get to come down here and, and teach and unfold the scriptures with you all. Really love and, and get to in, and really enjoy getting to do this. Um, if this. If this is your first time here, I want to say welcome. We are glad to have you here, um, and I also want to welcome our family joining us online. Great to have all of you with us wherever you might find yourself this Sunday morning. Um, I want to catch you up with what we're doing in high school ministry. So the Mexico season is gearing up. Uh, myself and my team just got back from Mexico. We do our pre-trip down there to make sure everything is, is okay. We take anywhere from 80 to 100 people down to Mexico. And I want to tell you about uh, a ministry opportunity that we found while we went down on our pre-trip. And, and I'll, do this, I'll do this quickly. We met, a, we met a woman down there named Tatiana. Tatiana is just an incredibly smart woman. She taught herself English just by watching TV. She's a lawyer by trade. Tatiana's first marriage ended in divorce, and it, it sent her into a little bit of a spiral. She started using drugs and, and ended up losing her practice, had to check into rehab. She comes out of rehab and starts working at a, at a strip club where she soon begins to pimp out the women working at this strip club. And she justifies it because she's sober, she's making money, and the girls are making money. What was the big deal? During this time, somebody begins to share the gospel with her. Somebody begins to lovingly and clearly share the gospel that a man 2,000 years ago lived a sinless life and traded his righteousness in for our wickedness. He took our place. Um, he served the sentence that we should have served, which is, which is death. He did it so we wouldn't have to, and it begins to change her heart. So long story short, we meet this girl down there. She now runs a girl's rehab center uh, where she reaches out to women that, that she used to exploit. She reaches out to the same kinds of women that, that were abused, drug addicted, trafficked. She shares the gospel with them. She disciples them. And, and she has a team of counselors help these women navigate the unbelievable trauma they've been through. Most of these women, 18 years and younger, most of them. And so, man, we get to meet her, and, and she's got all of these different ways we're going to partner with her, all of these different ways that we're going to join in her effort to help reach these lost women. We're going to build homes for people that are in extreme poverty. We're going to go out and partner with local churches and put on vacation Bible schools. We're going to play soccer with tons of little ninos, get whooped on by them, and then we're going to share the gospel with them, and then we're going to share the gospel. So if you're a high school student, this sounds like something you'd want to join in on. I got more information in the Welcome Center. We start our trainings today. We are gearing up, and we start this whole process today. Um, so if you could be praying for us, we would, we would love that. Here's what we're doing. We started a series last week called Blessed. In Acts chapter 20, Jesus is going to say these words. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And what we want to do is kick off 2016 with three weeks looking at how we handle finances in a godly way. What are the scriptures going to say when it comes to handling our finances now, today, we're in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Let me frame up for you what's happening here in this passage. David, King David, the same David that killed Goliath, is coming to the end of his life. And he gets the idea of building a temple for God. He wants to build a house of worship for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God comes to David and says, David, thanks, but no thanks. You're not going to be my guy. Solomon is going to build it. Your son is going to build me a temple. Nevertheless, David wants to start accruing resources, materials to be able to build this temple. And so he gathers together all the chief elders, all the, the men of influence in Israel. He gathers them all together. And being the very good leader that David is, he leads by example. The text is going to say here that David gave 3,000 talents of his own gold to the construction of the temple. You say, how much is a talent? It's about 75 pounds. So if you do the math on this, this is about 225,000 pounds of gold, David's own stash. He says, man, I, I'm giving this towards the temple, towards the construction of the temple. I'm giving silver. I'm giving all these other resources. Will you follow me? Will you follow suit in what I'm doing? 
the men go back to their tribes, back to their cities, and they return to Jerusalem with untold amounts of resources, gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, marble, precious stones. And they watch these resources just begin to pile up, pile and pile and pile. Now, once again, because David is a very good leader, before pride can begin to well up in their hearts, before pride can begin to um, stir up in their hearts, David says, men, we need to pray. Men, let's pray. And, and we're gonna read a portion of his prayer here, all right? Would you stand with me in honor of God's word? We're gonna read 1 Chronicles 29, verses 11 through 14. Verse 11 begins, yours, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the majesty and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I? But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you for these men and women in here. I want to thank you for these souls, Lord, that you've created and that you've fashioned together. And I pray now, Lord, that you would, you would teach them in a real way, a meaningful way, God. I pray that um, through, through these words, through the scriptures, your Holy Spirit teaches their hearts in deep ways. Uh, truth is, God, I can't do that on my own. Truth is, I'm just not, I'm not skilled enough, God. I'm just a human. If, if your Holy Spirit doesn't move now and doesn't stir and, and doesn't uh, give us eyes to see, uh, then this is gonna be me talking for 40 minutes and it's gonna be talking about stuff that no one's gonna remember. And so, Lord, I, I just humbly say I need your help. And I ask you to help. I ask you to be the driving force behind what we're doing here today. I love you, Jesus. You are worthy, my king. And it is in your beautiful name I pray. Amen. All right, before you sit down, before you sit down, somebody in here has a $100 bill and I need it. Somebody in here has a $100 bill. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. All right, you can sit down. You can sit down. Uh, it was Memorial Day 2015. This was Memorial Day last year. Uh, Rachel and I got invited over to a friend's house, and, and I'll let you kind of into what, what Rachel and I were feeling. I'll kind of bring you into our world here a little bit. Uh, get invited over to this friend's house. They got a beautiful backyard, spectacular backyard. Uh, people are hanging out, swimming. They heated the pool up, barbecues going, hamburgers, hot dogs. And, and they're, they're, um, all the families that were there were a little bit older than us. They're in their late 30s, early 40s. Their kids are kind of a little bit more grown up. And Rachel's about five months pregnant here. So we kind of felt like we, were, we felt honored uh, because we felt like we're kind of the younger couple, like finally get invited to the older couple's party. Like, like we're the younger sibling that finally gets to hang out with like the older brother and we were like wow this is this is cool and so we show up to the party and uh, people are swimming and um and I walk up towards the pool I'm like hey how's the water feel dude it's heated you gotta come in it feels great so I'm like all right let me feel it I'm walking up towards the pool now around the pool there is a two inch or uh, one or two inch lip a brick lip that goes around the whole pool now I'm focused on the water so I don't see this little brick lip all right so I'm walking up to kind of feel it. And as I'm walking up, I kneel down and I'm kind of dropping my weight to, to touch the water, right? As I walk up, my foot catches this little brick lip and my weight's already going forward and down and, and I feel myself tripping. So instinctively, I throw my hands out to catch myself. Problem is there's nothing but water in front of me. So that just kind of throws my momentum even farther forward. And what happens next is just like slow motion. I, I can remember just slowly like tumbling. No, 
no, slowly tumbling into the water and I fall into the water with my keys, with my phone, with my wallet. I mean, I'm fully clothed, just tumble in, tumble into the water. And I remember splashing down into the water, all the bubbles going around me. I'm down underneath the water and one thought crossed my mind. We're never getting invited back ever again. (laughs) Just blew it. I just blew it. So I come up out of the water and I actually like kind of hurt my knee and my knee was like cut open and, and I come up and, and kneel down on the pool deck and one of the kids that was there, Mark, comes up and he goes, dude, did you mean to do that? <laughs> and I was like, no, no, I didn't. He's like, well, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm okay. He goes, oh, good, because I would have felt really bad laughing at you if you were like seriously hurt. Now, I told you that I had my phone in my pocket. So we pull my phone out, pull it out of the case. It's totally waterlogged. We go into the kitchen, get a bag of rice, and we put the phone into a bag of rice. Um, This is a little trick to try and dry out the phone. And we, we set it in the bag of rice for a whole day, 24 hours. The next day, I pull the phone out and fire it back up. And it, it works, but it doesn't really work like it used to. Uh, like you have to slide the, the thing five or six times before the screen will actually unlock. Um, if I was text messaging and hit the backspace button, it would actually push the Q button. So if I ever made a mistake and tried to erase it, it would be like Q, 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 Q. Siri would just turn on and off like crazy. I mean, it still worked, but it didn't really work like it was supposed to. And the scriptures are going to say that the same things happened in our soul. That there once was a time when our soul instinctively, our, our default setting was to love and worship and adore God. But Adam and Eve transgressed, they rebel against God, and they've passed on to us a sinful nature. And that sinful nature has busted up our default settings now. We work, but we don't really work like we're supposed to. Instead of worshiping God, we worship stuff. Romans 1 is going to say it like this. We've traded the truth of God in for a lie. We worship and serve created things rather than the creator who's forever praised. Amen. And I don't know of another area where this plays out more clearly than money, than money. For about 98% of us, um, our idol, what we are going to pursue, love, and worship is going to be money. For some of you, it won't. For some of you, it'll be something else. But rest assured, the, the heart has already been kind of busted. It's already been broken. You're going to worship something in creation. That is our tendency. That's our default now, to no longer love God, to worship his stuff. So it might be your own intellect. It may be the fact that you are self-sufficient. You don't need church like those other weak people. It may be the fact that, that you're able to handle everything just on your own. It'll be something. You'll worship something in creation. You tracking with me? So before we start dealing with money here, what we need to do is pull back and see this default perspective. Um, this will be your first point here in your, in your outlines. Our default perspective now is to no longer use creation for the glory of God. It is to now just worship creation instead of God. In the same way that my phone kind of worked and, and, and could function a little bit, our souls now still worship, but they just worship the wrong thing. They're, they're, they're off. The, the circuit board's been a little bit waterlogged. Now, First Chronicles is going to unpack. It's going to describe how this perspective shifts. First Chronicles is going to give us some things that if we can wrap our arms around, that if we can really dig into, they're going to change how we view money. They're going to press into our, our default perspective that's wrong. They're going to try and change that perspective back into what it was meant to be, to where we don't worship money, but we actually use it for the glory of God. Now, let's take a look here at what the text is saying. If you pick it up with me in verse 11, David says these words, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Right out of the gates, David is going to paint a very big view of God, a very big view of God. Um, The temptation here is to read this text as if David's just paying some empty compliments before God as if David's just kind of doing a courtesy before God. Um, but if, if we don't read this really with some weight to it, with some theology to it, 
then here's what's gonna happen. We're going to keep a very elevated, puffed up view of ourselves and we're gonna continue to belittle and, and push God into a corner. We're gonna continue to minimize the God of the scriptures. So right out of the gates, if, if we don't have a big view of God, if we don't pick up on this, this will be your point here, they'll, they'll throw it up in just a little bit, a, a big view of God, um, we're never gonna handle our money in a godly way. We're never going to have the perspective that God wants for us. He, I'll just show you what David says here. He says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the greatness. Um, keep in mind what's happening here. They've piled together untold amounts of resources. I mean, can you imagine, like, if you came into this room and you saw it piled high with gold, silver, bronze, gems, diamonds, you'd be like, wow, this is pretty awesome. And David, knowing that this could be a tendency in their hearts, says, men, men, no, 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 no. As cool as you think this is, as great as you think that this is, how much greater must the one be who made all this stuff? There are going to be moments in your life where you are awestruck. There are going to be moments in your life where, where you are just, you're just speechless. It might be looking up at the Milky Way. It might be seeing a desert sunset. It might be, it might be standing at the rim of the Grand Canyon. And the temptation will be to look at that and go, man, that is so incredible. And then we stop with just that. But David's saying, no, if that looks incredible, how much greater must the one be who made it? How much greater must the one be who just spoke? He just spoke. And it came to creation. The scripture here is gonna go on and say that he's powerful that power and glory belong to him. There is a temptation within the church right now to overemphasize the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus at the expense of his unbelievably ferocious power. Um, there's a Jesus that gets talked a lot about now who, who just loves, just is gracious, is just compassionate. Um, and yes, he is those things. Absolutely, he is those things. But the scriptures are also going to show numerous instances where he's crazy powerful. I'll give you my favorite example. Um, we are a little bit lost on extreme weather. If it rains like half an inch in California, we are like losing our minds. If you're from the Midwest, if you're from back east, you know what severe weather is. You know what severe weather is. Jesus and his disciples are out on a boat and a severe storm sweeps across the lake to the point where the boat is about to sink. What's Jesus doing? He's sleeping. Love that. He's sleeping. The disciples shake him awake. Jesus, don't you care if we die? Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? And then the way a father rebukes his two-year-old son, he points up at the storm, quiet, be still. And the text says immediately, not 20 minutes later, not 30 minutes later, immediately the clouds break apart, the wind dies down, the huge rolling waves, quiet. The disciples don't worship. The disciples don't high five Jesus. Hey, great miracle again. The text says they're terrified because this man that they could touch, they could, they could see him, they could touch him. They're like, even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this? The very next chapter, they roll up on the beach and a man comes to them who's possessed by a legion of demons. You say, Chad, how much is a legion of demons? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's five to 6,000. In Roman divisions of army, a legion was anywhere from five to 6,000. This demon-possessed man rolls up on Jesus. You would think that a legion of demons, there'd be strength in numbers, that they'd be like, okay, there's 5,000 of us, there's only one of him. You grab his ankles, you grab his arms, you go for the head, we can take him. They run to Jesus. They fall down at his feet. What do you want with us, son of the most high God? We know who you are. Have you come to destroy us? Okay, this man used to break irons apart. They used to shackle him with chains and he'd break the chains apart. He used to hang out in tombs and cut his arms open, screaming at the top of his lungs. This guy makes that girl from the Exorcist movie look like a wimp, falls before the feet of Jesus. We know who you are. 
have you come to destroy us? Is he loving? Absolutely. Is he merciful and compassionate more than you'll ever know? Is he also the lion of the tribe of Judah? Yeah. You don't mess with lions, bro. They'll rip your face off. Yeah. He's powerful. David, right out of the gates, he's not just paying empty compliments to God. He's not just like, well, let's compliment him and then let's get to the real stuff. This is the real stuff. No, no, God's big. He's really, really big. And if we don't see how big he is and how tiny we are, we're never gonna change our perspective on money. We're never going to change that. The heart has got to see he's way beyond us. He's way bigger than us. Text goes on here and says this. I need you to do a little work with me, okay? Middle of verse 11. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Okay, how much in the heaven and in the earth is God's? Oh, you're brilliant. You are wonderful. So much better than the other service. 12, both riches and honor, both riches and honor come from you. What comes from him? Okay, that was a little bit weaker, but here we go. We'll do 14. Middle of 14, for all things come from you. How many things? All things come from him. God owns everything. Your second point here. God owns everything. Hear me. You ready? Your stuff, your possessions, your home, your money, your credit cards, your toys, your Roth IRA, your 401k, your investments, your retirement portfolio, all of it. It's God's first. It's his. Okay, you ready for a wildly unpopular idea? Your life is his. He gave it to you. Deuteronomy 32, 39. God says this, I kill and I make alive. Oh, we don't like that. But once again, David's not talking about a small, controllable God. He's talking about a big God. A big God who has power, majesty, glory, power. He's got it all. So the prominent theologian, Gwen Stefani, um, she says these words. <laughs> so dumb. She writes a song, It's My Life, Don't You Forget. With all due respect, no, it's not. No, it's not. God gave you that life, and he's going to take it away when he pleases. Here's what I found. Nine times out of ten, death catches us by surprise. Occasionally, we're ready for it. But most of the time, here's what we hear. Man, we didn't see it coming. I know that because I work at a church and we have to do funerals. Most of the time, we don't see it coming. Now, we love to do this as well. Well, Chad, I worked for it. No, 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 Chad, I don't buy into that. I went in, I went in early. I stayed late. I worked six days a week, 12 hours a day. I'm the one that earned that money. I'm the one that worked hard to get that stuff. No, that boat's mine. No, that car is mine. No, that new set of golf clubs, that's mine. The Bible's not going to let you get away with that. It's not going to let you get away with that. I love you, okay? Let me just lovingly share a verse with you. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17. 8, 17. Just listen. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. That text just said, yeah, you, you may have gotten up early and you may have worked hard, but who's the one that gives you the ability to work hard? Who's the one that lets you get up this morning? Your life isn't yours. It belongs to a sovereign almighty God. Wildly unpopular idea. But we're talking about a big God. We're not talking about a small controllable God. Big God. Big God. Your stuff belongs to God first and foremost. Belongs to him first and foremost. So if that's the case, if God truly owns everything, then the question becomes, well, where do we fit into the mix? How do we fit into this equation? We are called to steward. We are called to steward. You say, what does that word steward mean? Steward is simply this. 
It means to manage someone else's property. I think one of the best jobs in the world is to house sit. Um, house sitting is awesome because you get to, if it's a cool house, if it's a lame house, then, then the job's not that good. But if it's a cool house, all you get to do is just sit in someone's house, use their stuff until they come back, and you get paid for doing that. You get paid to just live. It's awesome. It's really cool. That's stewarding. That's exactly what stewarding is. Somebody trusts you with their property for you to take care of it until they get back. And this is how God describes us. We get this idea from two places primarily. First Peter 4.10 Peter will call us to be good stewards of God's grace, of God's varied grace, of the different gifts that he gives us. We're called to be good stewards of that. Jesus in the Gospels uses a parable. He explains a parable one of two ways, depending which gospel you're in. He either uses a talent or a minus. They're both currency. It's both money. There's a master that comes to three servants, and each servant is given the same amount of money. The master goes on a journey, comes back some amount of years later, Comes up to servant number one, what did you do with the money I gave you? Master, I increased it tenfold. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Second master, or second servant, what did you do with the money I gave you? I increased it fivefold. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Third servant, what did you do with my money? I buried it in the ground and I did nothing. You wicked servant. You wicked servant. Jesus is explaining something here. You've been given resources. You've been given time. You've been given gifts to use for the glory of God. You're called to manage his property. You're called to manage his stuff. So this past week, this past week, we put out a uh, Starbucks gift card on Instagram, and we asked you all to, to buy people cups of coffee, to buy people cups of coffee. Here's what we found. You're really good at spending other people's money. I mean, within the first two hours, there were a lot of cups of coffee bought, which was awesome because we wanted to be generous. But we also wanted to demonstrate when, when it's not your money, it's really easy to spend it. It's really easy to be generous with it. It's real easy to hold it with an open hand, right? All those you have teenagers, you're like, yeah, my kids blow through my money like crazy, some of you haven't heard a word I've said this entire time because you're wondering uh, why Matt, a little bit earlier, ran up here and gave me $100. You're wondering why he did that. And you're like, man, Chad just suckered that guy out of $100. Here's what you don't know. Before this service started, I went up to Matt and said, I'm gonna give you this. It's a real $100 bill. I'm gonna give you this, and I'm gonna ask for it back. When I ask for it back, I want you to bring it up to me as soon as possible. Do you know why he brought it up to me as soon as possible? Because I told him, if you don't, I'll slash your tires. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just playing. Because it wasn't his. It wasn't his to begin with. Real easy to be generous with money when it's not your own. So God owns everything. Now you may be sitting here saying, Chad, I just don't buy it. I don't buy it. This all sounds like a giant ploy, a giant scheme to just trick people into giving you money. I'm not getting suckered in. Why should I care? Why should I even put into practice this idea of stewardship, of managing God's finances his way? No, 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 forget that. I'm just gonna keep doing it my way. Why should I care? Your last point is this. Stewardship is ultimately for our joy. I'll say it like this. Stewardship is ultimately for our freedom. It's for our freedom. The very prominent theologian, Notorious B.I.G., wrote a song called Mo Money, Mo Problems. And the lyrics go like this. I don't know what they want from me, but it's like the more money we come across, the more problems we see. Solomon in, in Ecclesiastes, I can't, I hope I meet Solomon in heaven I got some questions for this guy because he lived hard. <laughs> Dude lived. I got some questions for him. King Solomon in the, in the scriptures is described as the most wealthy man to ever rule in Israel and in the history of the entire world, in the history of the entire world, the wealthiest king ever. Um, the scriptures will say that he got 100,000 pounds of gold brought to him every year. So I did a little math. I did a little math. The current exchange rate for gold right now, 100,000 pounds is uh, like $2.8 billion dollars. 
King Solomon ruled for 40, 40 years, plus or minus. So that's, I don't know, I can't do math well. It's a lot of money, okay? That's a whole bunch of money. Um, and King Solomon, at the end of his life, says three things. Number one, it doesn't matter how much money I get, I'm still gonna die like the poor man dies. And here's, here's what's even worse. Here's insult to injury. I've got to now turn this money that I worked so hard for over to somebody who didn't work hard for it. And they're probably going to be done with it. They're probably going to blow it on something dumb. It's vanity. Then he says this, and this has stuck with me. Whoever loves money will never have money enough. Solomon says, I've been stuck on this hamster wheel trying to chase more and more money. And when I get more, all I want is more. I'm stuck. I, I, I keep chasing after this dream that, that more money is gonna finally fulfill my soul. And when I get more, I just want more. I'm trapped. And then he says this, I found that I can't even enjoy my money. I work so hard for this money and the people that actually enjoy it are all my friends that mooch off of me. I'm not even the one that enjoys it. So he goes, this is vanity. This is absolute vanity. This is meaningless. Whoever loves money will never have money enough. Paul in 1 Timothy 6, those who love money, who desire to be rich, have stabbed themselves with many pains. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now listen, some of you, God's gifted with finances. God's blessed you with finances. It's not wicked. It's not wicked to have money. Wicked to idolize it. It'll enslave you to idolize it. So maybe, just maybe, just maybe, God calls us to stewardship, not because he's trying to get from us, but he's trying to show us how money works. Maybe, just maybe, if God is who he says he is, if he is big, if he has created everything, maybe he's trying to show us how to steward his, his resources, not so he can get a dollar bill from us, but because he actually cares about our joy. Maybe, just maybe, he's trying to say, if you handle money like this, it'll go well for, for you. You try and wrap your arms around this, love it, worship it, hoard it, be selfish with it. It'll trap you, it'll enslave you. So maybe he really cares for our joy. How many times are we gonna have to hear wealthy people say, Money, money's cool in the beginning, but it doesn't ultimately make you happy? Like how many times are we gonna have to watch rich people's lives just implode before we actually buy into what the scriptures are saying? The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. If money is what you worship, it's going to enslave you. You'll be stuck on the hamster wheel chasing something you'll never, ever get. Meanwhile, Christ stands there saying, I've come to give you life and life to the full. Will you follow me? Will you trust me? Will you do this the way I've laid it out? So what do we do with all this info? I mean, what do we do with everything that we've just talked about here? Because you and I have inherited a sinful nature from Adam and Eve, our, our souls are off. Our default perspective is going to be worship money, not God. I hope that you've seen through this, through this text here that God is alone worthy of our worship. And he doesn't call for us to worship him because he's egotistical and insecure. He calls us to worship him because this is what we were designed for. He's trying to get us back to what our original settings were before the phone got dropped in the pool. He's trying to fix us and get us back to where we once were, to love and adore him, not stuff. He's trying to, trying to fix. He's trying to get us back, back on track, back what we were made for. You and I were made to be stewards. We were made to manage God's stuff and manage it to the glory of his name. We were made for that. So what is it today? Where, where have, where, which one of these perspectives needs to change? Did you come in here today with a small view of God? Did you have a real tiny, um, boxed in, belittled view of God? Have you bought into the lie that you actually own stuff? Have you bought into the lie that your life is yours? 
Are you refusing to see yourself as God has described you, a steward, not an owner, a steward? Maybe, maybe you've known all those things, but you haven't taken that final step to say, I'm gonna trust that when I give, I, I'm, I'm leading myself into joy. I'm gonna take that, that step of when I am a steward, a good steward of God's time, resources, energy, money, that leads me into joy. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna pray in just a little bit. And as I pray, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask the Lord that he would just root around in your heart a little bit. I'm gonna ask that the Lord would dig around in there a little bit and show you what, what you really love, what you really worship. And then I'm gonna ask he would be gracious enough to, to reveal to you how it's just entrapping, enslaving you. I'm gonna ask that he would give you the eyes to see that when, when you repent and follow him, uh, it leads to joy and it leads to life. And then after that, we are going to celebrate because there are men and women who have come here today and, and they wanna get baptized. Um, they've made the decision to trust Jesus and I trust them. And they're gonna publicly declare it before all of us. And so we're gonna sit in here and, and when they get dunked and come up out of the water, we're gonna applaud we're gonna say, praise God, praise his glorious name. And then afterwards, our prayer team's gonna come up and they're gonna be available for prayer if you need to talk, if you, if you have questions, if you need to figure out how this works more, they're gonna be available. I'll be over in the Welcome Center as well. If this is your first time here, I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to just get to say hi, welcome you. Would you bow? Would you pray with me? So God, I thank you for the scriptures and I thank you that you, you love us enough, God, to, um, to tell us the truth and you love us enough to uh, maybe, maybe push against our sensitivities. Um, you love us enough to go after the things that, um, that we idolize, Lord. And if it's not money, it'll be something else, Lord. Seems like it usually is money, though. I know that's the case for me. And so my heart, God, my prayer is that as we, as we just pray now, as we just pray now, would you reveal what's really in our hearts, God? Would you root around in there and show us, show us what we've been loving and worshiping in place of you? And then, God, would you show us, would you show us, Lord, how to, how to repent of that? And not begrudgingly, not half-heartedly run back to you, but run back to you with joy, run back to you with great um, eagerness because we run back to the one who has life, who has joy, who has fulfillment, the fulfillment that our soul is yearning for. I thank you, Lord, that, that you've designed stewardship not so that you get stuff. You've designed stewardship so that you could give to us Pray these things in Christ's holy name.